You're listening to Body Banter, a podcast where we have conversations about the human body in all its forms and from as many perspectives we can find. We are your hosts, Shagun Yedile and Claudia Krebs. And we are professors of anatomy in the Faculty of Medicine at the University of British Columbia in Vancouver, Canada. Anatomy is for everybody and every body. And we're here to get the body banter going. We hope you enjoy this episode. Hi, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Body Banter. My name is Claudia Krebs, and I am joining you from the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh Nations, also known as Vancouver, Canada. And with me, of course, is Shagan Oyadeli. Hi, Shagan. How are you? I'm great, Claudia. I'm nice to be with you again. And I'm Shagan Oyadeli, and I am calling you and speaking today from Kelowna. Um, which is in the traditional and unceded territories of the Silks Okanagan nations. And I am so proud today to have to introduce our guest to you. Um, Bevel Kramer and I go really way, way, way back. And I fondly call her prof because she is uh, my professor of a long, like long, <laughs> from long, way, way, way back. And so I'll allow her to introduce herself. Uh, would you kindly introduce yourself, please? <laughs> Hi, everybody. I'm Beverly Kramer. I'm speaking to you from Johannesburg, South Africa, on a rather cold evening. And I'm delighted to be with you. And thanks to Segun and Claudia and B for inviting me to be with you tonight. Well, it's great to have you here. So, Bev, you're currently the president of the International Federation of Anatomy Associations, and you're the head of anatomy. You have had so many leadership roles in anatomy. Tell us about your journey, how you became an anatomist. So, uh, Claudia, at the moment, I'm no longer a head of an anatomy department. I'm retired now. So congratulations, um, that's a huge milestone. <laughs> the time, but it's all working. I always say that you don't kill off um, anatomy professors. We're so pickled by the formula and we remain around forever. Anyway, when I started out after school, I, I knew I wanted to do surgery. But then I think I got a bit muddled and didn't know whether to follow a science pathway or a medical pathway and ended up doing first my BSc, a medical BSc with full anatomy. In those days, we did 700 hours of anatomy dissection um, and then went on to do a, a BSc honours forgive me, but specializing in, on the one side, morphological anatomy, and on the other side, histology and embryology. When I first got to dissect, I became fascinated, really fascinated by the human body. I was amazed at how, and I mean all of us as anatomists say this, I was amazed at how things found where to go in the body, how they managed to get if they were a nerve to the right muscle to innovate it or as a blood vessel to get to the right place to do what they had to do. And as a result, I, I stuck in anatomy. When I did my honours, I then became introduced to an embryologist, an experimental embryologist, and became fascinated by the topic of embryology, which became my research field in later life. I went on and did my PhD in embryology, but was lucky in that I grew up under a very famous South African and international anatomist by the name of Philip Tobias. And Philip believed in training us to the full. So in our school, we tend to, some people tend to teach morphological anatomy, others teach histology. Well, he made me do everything. So I taught morphological anatomy. I taught detailed histology, 
detailed embryology, I went on when I was appointed lecturer, lecturer to teach in physical anthropology, um, all that type of thing. And so it really gave me a good grounding in anatomy. And I really loved the topic. And that's where I've been ever since. So I grew up in the Witt University, the Witt Medical School. But in parallel, there was another um, department of anatomy in Johannesburg, and that was the anatomy department in the dental faculty. And a post became available there at some stage um, as a senior lecturer. And so I left the medical department and went to the dental department as senior lecturer. And then a few years later was appointed as head of that department. Uh, so I played a leadership role in that department, and I also learned new things. I learned this whole new field of oral biology. And that added to my expertise, obviously, and the, the leadership position as head of the department in the Faculty of Dentistry gave me a lot of good management skills. And I worked, I think, in that faculty with very understanding people who nurtured me and saw my potential. A few years later, the dental anatomy department was merged with the bigger medical anatomy department. And the two faculties asked me to take on that leadership role again as head of the conjoined department. And that's where I still remain today, not as head anymore, obviously, because I've retired, but I was head of that school for many years called the School of um, Anatomical Sciences. That's where Segun caught up with me. And so in total, I had an uninterrupted flow of about 17 years as heads of department. Right. Let, um, let me, can I come in uh, sure. at that stage to say that, um, I mean, th I mean, this is a wonderful and illustrious career. I mean, Philip Tobias and I, I'm so lucky that I got to meet him um, in the department. Um, that's like anatomy royalty, <laughs> you know, all over the world. Did you have a coronation for him? Because, I mean, <laughs> we just went through that, right? <laughs> no, no, I know. Um, because it, it it tells me, I mean, it speaks a lot about his leadership, you know, recognizing the the potential in you and kind of encouraging you to not only focus on embryology, but also on the morphological anatomy, um, anthropology, and all of those different facets of, of anatomy. And I'm wondering, you know, and you've been in leadership, obviously, you were you are my mentor. Um, and I don't know for the for those who are listening, the full disclosure that Professor Kramer was my PhD advisor. So um, um, we worked together for for a long time, and uh, you know maybe another day I'll tell you all the secrets, but not <laughs> not today. Not today. <laughs> but you know, talking about that, you know, what do you see as the ingredients of of leadership and and mentorship? Those kind of things that help help you um, develop along the way uh, where our young people can benefit from, or even those of us who are now in leadership and aspire to mentor others. Uh, what are those ingredients, qualities of leadership and mentorship that we need to, that we need to develop? So, Sagan, I always say I didn't really have a mentor in my early days. Philip Tobias did open up all these opportunities for me, but I never spent time really talking through my goals, my wishes, the pathways to the future. Um, I found that it was often people outside of my own school who would come to me and say, don't you think you should apply for this? Or don't you think you would be good at that? Sadly, I never had it in my own school, direct mentorship, I'm saying. And, and it was for that reason that I have been very conscious and willing to give informal mentorship, maybe, to many, and formal mentorship, in a way, to others. 
So at the current time, I'm mentoring about seven or eight people, if I could say formally, is that I assign or we assign an hour every month where we get together and chat. And I think it's really so important because it's a situation of trust when you mentor. They must trust you, you trust them. You speak of things perhaps you wouldn't disclose to other of your colleagues. Um, one can suggest ways for that person to follow. Obviously, your mentor can't mandate what you should do, but if they're listening to you and if you can see that they need a bit of a jog in one direction, that is a wonderful opportunity. And I think everybody should have a mentor. So Sagan will tell you that in when I came back to the medical school, when I was head of School of Anatomical Sciences, in the school was an older professor, a man by the name of Professor Jack Allen. And I and, and Jack were very, very close friends. And although at that stage I didn't really have a mentor, when things were worrying me, even at that stage of seniority, I used to go into his office and say, gosh, this is bugging me. And we talk about it and he might have suggested something to do or just by the action of talking to him, I managed to sort things out. He was fantastic. And so for everybody, no matter how young or how old, I, I really truly believe we all need a mentor. Bev, that really resonates with me. I, um, I've been very fortunate to have fantastic mentors. And I also had a really disappointing thing happen very early on in my career. Um, there was, anyway, there was a senior woman in the department who was asked, why don't you help her? And, um, and then apparently, I mean, I wasn't there, but I heard that she responded, nobody helped me and she'll figure it out. And so um, I, and then I had other mentors step up and I, I've been, um, you know, I've been really well mentored and it's a huge privilege now to pass that mentorship on to the next generation of junior profs who've, uh, who are uh, at UBC. So you talk about this community building, which I think is really important for a, a sort of an academic department because you want a department to truly be a, a community, not just an administrative unit. Um, What's your what's your secret? So I think things have changed, to be quite honest, Claudia. I see it in the young people today that they're not as eager to participate in community things, whereas in the older days, I think we were more open to it. I think it's this pressure on everyone to publish. Um, the pressure to take on more postgraduate students, which leaves people today with less time when they can communicate. And I'm a great believer in communication. I love having seminars in a department or school where we all come together to listen to the seminar. Um, not only the morphologists, not only the histologists, but everybody must come together because I found that by having these joint seminars that I learned so much more about other fields um, and we communicate and we learn other things, hidden things. You learn to behave as a professional, especially for those of us at the bottom end of Africa where not all of us can travel all over the world and be exposed to conferences and other professionals. So these, these opportunities within departments or schools to get together, to give people constructive feedback on how to communicate, how to present, um, to get them to participate and to see their discipline as an important part of health sciences, I think is very important. And I, I, I'm sad in that I think sometimes in these days that is being lost because people are too busy with climbing the ladder for themselves. Right. And, and I, I see some of that, uh, Prof, because um, 
I'm younger, but I've also seen some of those changes too. Um, how um, the community perhaps is not as as you know, especially in, in some departments, as not as cohesive and and you know together as it could be. Um, and and it's a it's a shame. But I was going to ask you um, maybe do you see some things that have changed for the better for example you know like we've seen some things that have not worked well like the community perhaps um particularly you know as as um as things evolve and things change um do you see anything for example in terms of mentorship in terms of bringing up the younger academics and scientists that are maybe better um have we done so, yeah so what's better um it's also worse but it's better and that's being able to communicate with people all over the world through the internet and as we are tonight having a zoom meeting our young people today can be in touch with anybody anywhere in the world at the press of a button and I think that's fantastic. And I wish they would make more use of that. Obviously, I say it's also bad because it always interrupts our lives and sometimes there's too much of it or whatever. But there is so much available online today that young people can participate in, join different discussion groups. And that, again, forms a wonderful community. Um, for so, Beth, when, you, when we're looking at that international community, as the president of the International Federation of Anatomy Associations, you are really bringing anatomists from around the world together. And I love that huge umbrella when, you know, we um, talk not just in the North American or European context, those are the two contexts that I'm most involved in. But when we have an IFAA meeting, and you kind of get perspectives from around the world. And I remember our last pre pandemic meeting in London, which was fabulous to just get a lot of sort of impressions and, and uh, feedback from people. But much more memorable in many ways was our Zoom conference that we had during the pandemic. It allowed folks who couldn't travel to whatever, death. I think we were supposed to meet in Turkey that year, um, yes. and it would have been cost prohibitive for many of the presenters to participate. But in the Zoom format, we had uh, young anatomists from around the world, notably from African nations, participate and present and I learned so much, and I, I really thought this is a fantastic format, actually, for something that is usually extremely expensive, despite the fact that I missed not being in person. I love hanging out with people as well. But um, yeah, so where do you see the future of these meetings going? Like, How do we find that balance? Can I touch on two things there? Why I enjoy my involvement in the IFAA and why I've been trying to develop certain aspects of it is because I do think it brings people from all nations together. And through that bringing together, we begin to understand better things about each other. For example, ethics. Things that might be ethically acceptable in one country aren't necessarily in another country. And we as an IFAA need to be aware of that. We can't do something that is going to offend other people. And it's so important then to bring everybody around a table and be able to speak to those things. So one is from America and one is from the bottom end of Africa or from Asia. I think it's so important to voice one's opinion and to be heard and understood. The second point you make, <clears throat> I was actually in Istanbul at the time of the last IFA Congress. We went to support the organizers and I loved listening to everybody from around the world. And the presentations were excellent. And it was great that people who couldn't afford to attend could still attend. But there was one thing that was missing for me. 
when it came to tea time, I couldn't go and hang out with Sagan. I couldn't go and say to B, hi B, I've seen you online, but now's an opportunity to really talk to you. So that for me miss, is really missing. Um, to argue about something in anatomy over a cup of coffee, you know, you can present and ask a question. You can argue around the discussion, but just meeting people in person and getting to understand them, that only happens, I believe, in person. And so the next conference, as you know, is in South Korea, and we're already busily planning for that. We already have uh, liaison committees ongoing between myself and some people from the IFAA executive with the South Korean Organizing Committee. And that, that Congress, I think, is going to be a knockout because these guys are so on top of everything. So I, I, I'm encouraging you all to start saving your pennies. I am already to try and get there. I'm not too sure, and we will discuss this at our next meeting, whether they will be able to have a hybrid um, function. And the other thing is, you know that I started um, initiative to fund postgraduates from low-income countries and emergent anatomists. We will continue that in Korea. And the Koreas, Koreans are so important and, sorry, so interested in that aspect that they are also going to set aside an amount of money to try and assist people in getting to the conference. I can't tell you exactly yet what format theirs will be. The IFAA format will still be paying for the registration of 10 postgraduate students and 10 um, academics, emergent academics. I know that doesn't sound like a very lot, but that's unfortunately all we can afford at this stage. I that's do think really remarkable, Bev, when we think about it, right? Like just that support, that recognition goes a long way in supporting people in their career development as well. Um, so you touched on a really important thing, and that is sort of equity and access to education, equity and access to information, to exchange, to academic growth. And we know that there are huge disparities in the world and you're living right in it, being in South Africa, your neighboring countries and, and many academics within your own country are facing these uh, really large socioeconomic barriers. And so if we can kind of go away from current policy and and just maybe dream big. How do we address this uh, to achieve more equitable access to knowledge, education, uh, and career opportunities for everyone? Think big, like nothing that may exist right now, just go wild. I'd love to hear what your vision and your dream for this is. So, so I'm going to speak specifically about anatomy, seeing that's our topic tonight. But I do think it would be helpful if, excuse me, those countries or those schools or departments, you know, Claudia, I'm a big believer in taking a small step and building on that step because then it mushrooms. But for example, when I was assistant dean in the faculty some years back for research and postgraduate support, I started what was known as the Witz Alumnus Diaspora program. And I didn't have much money to start. I scraped some money together and brought my first alumni home to set up research collaborations with different researchers in our faculty. So this was across the entire faculty. second has been on the program, and I do think it's been of value. I then got not because I applied for it, but because a large foundation heard about it, thought it was worthwhile, they came to me and said, how much money do you want in order to continue this? And that was the Carnegie Foundation of New York. And they funded me from 2013 until last year. So what I'm trying to say is, if 
some schools or departments around the world could afford it. They could invite an anatomist, a young anatomist from a low resource country to perhaps come and visit. If they could pay a minimum for an air ticket, a little bit of accommodation, who needs more than that, a bit of food, to spend some time to learn some skills, to see, to be exposed to what there is and take that knowledge back home. That's a small step. You get three people doing it the first year, five people doing it the next. It, it, it mushrooms. Also, many of the well-resourced universities have excellent electronic resources. Okay, and part of the IFAA, one of the committees, is looking at that, trying to get these resources to make available. So I would see, and I think it's going to become more and more important because there's going to be a bigger and bigger economic divide for the better resourced people in the world to try and assist with resourcing the lower resourced individuals. That's one of the ways. And I don't think it will happen overnight. I think it will happen by small incremental steps. And if I were to have, and I can't have a further term in the IPA, but I hope my successor will, perhaps that's one of the next routes to follow. Trying to organize some exchange in order to educate those who who aren't able to get our resources back home. Well, that does that answer your question? I'm sure, I'm sure it does. If I jump in here, um, it, it does for me. Um, the, the message take home I get from there is to like, it's going to happen in incremental steps. It's not going to happen all at once. And that people um, should have a vision for that. Um, and, and, and so that more um, better resourced departments and better resourced institutes and, and countries should reach out to help those who are less uh, resourced. And, and, I, and I think our different um, regional organizations like the AAA and, um, and the um, American Association of Clinical Anatomists and all of these other bodies can also, and I, I know that in some measure they already have those kind of programs. And, and so I think the idea is for them to expand those programs and, and uh, improve that along the way. I wanted to return to embryology because that's, I know that's a passion of yours um, uh, because that's a passion of mine as well. And, um, and recently I've been thinking about it because uh, obviously I teach embryology um, and uh, Claudia as well. And we've been having, um, together with B, we, we teach in this program for a biomedical visualization course where, um, you know, people who are interested in visualizing anatomy, visualizing science in different ways, they, they learn about how to do that. And one of the, one of their courses is embryology. And the, the problem has always been people complain, as, as you are aware, that, oh, embryology is so difficult <laughs> and that because those everything is happening at a microscopic scale uh, and they don't understand how that fits in and maybe it should not be taught. And actually, uh, research shows that embryology hours have fallen terribly uh, in, in the medical programs, at least in the different uh, uh, programs uh, and teaching departments uh, around the world. So my question is, how do we revive that? Is there a way back <laughs> for embryology teaching, or is it just going to be a nose, you know, just a dive down? Um, how do we, how do we uh, um, impart that importance, the knowledge that this is important for medicine, for practice, for science? In many many different types of ways, and is the, have you have you thought of that? How how can embryology teaching um, experience a, a, a revival of sorts? So, Sagan, I think that's what fascinated me about the human body. I look at the diaphragm and I see it's being innervated by a nerve in the cervical region. And if I'm a thinking person, surely I must ask the question: How? 
does this happen? And that's the basis of anatomy. It's embryology. How do we make it easier for people to study and understand? You know, for me, if I were to start an anatomy curriculum all over again, I wouldn't lecture at all in morphological anatomy. That's if there's a dissection course, I simply do the dissection. Everything's there. But what I would lecture in is embryology. And I would do what I did in my day. I try and use models and three-dimensional, uh, even silly models to show and to show how things change over time. Because most people, I don't think, can think in three dimensions, let alone four dimensions. And you've got to think in four dimensions in order to understand embryology. But remember, I mean, Anne Andrew designed that magnificent model, which I still use to this day, of gut rotation. Once you've seen that model on gut rotation and you look at the abdomen, there's no problem with understanding why things are where they are. So, yeah, I think we as teachers are at fault. If we make it exciting for our students, if we make the links between the normal anatomy and the embryology, I mean, at the dental school, I started a really intensive course on head and neck um, congenital abnormalities. And our favorite topic, neural crest. And uh, if you make it exciting, if you find ways to show them the development, you will find they will be interested and come back for more. Absolutely. That resonates again so much. I, um, I teach an anatomy course for midwifery students and um, we link like every organ system, everything, I start with the embryology to set them up and to, of course, help them understand development and newborn physiology better and then uh, bring it uh, to the adult. And um, I have actually learned so much anatomy just by taking this approach. And I've gotten much, much deeper understanding of uh, relationships and um, and why things end up the way they do, right? By really diving into the anatomy uh, into the embryology that way yeah it's, so i i really appreciate this approach and it's uh, it's very sad that in many curricula we uh we don't have the time to do that we don't have mm -hmm. the focus to do that and i think we're we're losing a little bit of understanding and we get more students kind of scared of it because they're like it's so complicated i don't want to go near it i'm like listen we're not going to talk about signaling receptors and uh, mm -hmm. uh you know all of that no we're just going to talk about how things move and and what happens um yeah so you oh, have this love for embryology as i do i can see that as does well, seven i always tell the students i'm a bit of a closeted embryologist because <laughs> you know because mm. it's like this i think the deeper you dive into anatomy the more you realize that you got to know your embryology. And so I was that typical student who in the embryology course that I had to take, I was like going through it, just thinking, oh my God, I hope I pass and this will make sense one day. And, and then I kind of avoided embryology for the first part of my career thinking, thank God I don't have to teach this. And then I started realizing this is the most fascinating thing ever. So I've been diving deeper and deeper into it. It wasn't a first love. It was really uh, something that grew over time. So yeah. I really must try and find the paper that was written by Anne Andrew in which she describes this making of the model and send it to you because we have the models in the department and we've used it. Or I've used the same model, I think, for going on 50 years. I remember that model very well <laughs> and, uh, and I enjoy those lectures and I would I would really love to recommend that you should sit in Prof Kramer's embryology lecture you would always remember <laughs> how, how everything ended up where they are in the human body well talking about that maybe we should then ask you um do you have a favorite uh you know you've taught 
a lot in many different anatomy regions of the body and embryology of the body. And you so you have this vast experience in embryology education and anatomy education. Do you have a favorite body organ or body part? Yeah, that's a, a really difficult question. I think I really, as I've told you, I'm passionate about the body. I love teaching the anatomy of the thorax and the head and neck, even though it's so involved. Maybe my favorite organ, strangely, is the brain, because it it's still it's still a bit of a mystery. Although we know so much about it, we still don't know as much as we'd like to know. So maybe that's my favorite organ. Beautiful. That's my favorite part too. <laughs> 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 and so um what's your least favorite body part i mean <laughs> we don't really like talking about it it's kind of like talking about your least favorite child which of course you know you don't have your least favorite student which of course you also don't have but what's your least favorite body part if you had to say so, something I, I know what my least favorite part is and that's the lower limb because that was the part we dissected last. That was the rush before our exams. That was the part I think I never really thoroughly got to know. I remember spotting on the lower leg for a uh, lower limb for our exams. And what came up in the paper was the ankle joint. And I froze and thought, my God, how am I going to write anything about that? And I looked around the exam room and all of my classmates were sitting there palpating their ankle joint to see if there was anything they could remember to write about it. So maybe the lower limb has remained a bit of a mystery to me and is my least favorite. That's so relatable <laughs> because... <laughs> You are absolutely right about that. <laughs> we we leave it to the end, and then we get to the is the sole of the foot, especially you know <laughs> where everything is just complicated. So many crisscrossing tendons, fascia, everything is so hard to dissect. And yeah, I can understand why why that can <laughs> why that is your least favorite part. Well, we have come to the end of um, this body banter and it, it remains for us to really thank you um, for sharing your knowledge and your wealth of experience with us. We've really enjoyed talking to you today. Yeah, thank you so much, Bev. Your thoughts on leadership and how to bring the anatomy community around the world together uh, to break down barriers, socioeconomic barriers, communication barriers, and to build a a true community of scholars has been a real inspiration. Thank you for that. And uh, thank you for making a real plug for, for mentorship. I think that's um, one of the key things in building community. And um, well, thank you for loving the brain. What can I say? Thank you, <laughs> thank you to all of you. <clears throat> really, it's been such a pleasure and such a joy talking to you. And I really appreciate the invitation. Thank you so much. And that wraps Thanks. up another episode of Body Banter. We'll see you and talk to you next time. Thank you for listening to another episode of Body Banter. We are Claudia and Shegun. And we look forward to having you join us for more conversations about the human body next time. <laughs>